I think of myself as a multidisciplinary artist, right? But just as an artist. Right? So I'm calling it from uh, Boston, Mass, Jamaica, you know, Jamaica Plain is where my studio is located. I was born in Guyana, South America, and uh, I grew up here in Boston. I uh, lived in Boston the majority of my life. And, um, you know, in terms of thinking about art, it was a very different experience for me growing up because it was really more about culture, you know? Like, so I grew up with, you know, people who were doing like, you know, creating masks, creating, you know, um, different images and clothing for festivals and events, right? That are related to like carnival. And so I, I grew up with a culture where, you know, there wasn't a separation between art and like a, as a institution in terms of like the, the academic aspect around art. Art was more about just the self-expression and it came through from a cultural impetus that was definitely based around Africa, right? But also around the Guyanese culture. What are you committed to as an artist? It's an interesting question. What are you committed to? I think I'm committed to trying to be a vehicle and express some of the information and ideas and concepts that come to me that I feel that are important and try to share those with the world. How would you say your time at Brandeis impacted the way you see the world as an artist? I think my, my time at Dice really did two things. One is it gave me an understanding around how do you think about the world as a creative, you know, and, and what model do you create for yourself? You know, what does that look like? And I think Brandeis has, uh, and is an environment that encourages creativity and exploration. By year, we call ourselves the late night crew, you know? So we're always there late night, there's Ari, Felber, Tam, you know, that's like the, like we were like that late night crew that came into the studio and just worked. And, but then I had, you know, that the sports aspect of it, you know, which was like the whole body kinesthetic, being an athlete and playing for the judges and having the opportunity to see the breath um, and kind of, you know, expand, you know, your thinking around these content areas and subject matters allow you to become a richer person. So that, I think that's the best way of what uh, I think my experience at Brandeis illustrated to me and showed me. We definitely overlapped in some of our classes, so yep. it's fun to yeah. hear you talking about, um, you know, definitely the professors who are all still there today teaching, yeah. you know, new students every day. Okay, so I think now that we know a little bit more kind of about you and your history, let's move in a little bit to your work. What does a typical day look like for you in your studio or in your life in general as an artist? And I have to first start off with I have two beautiful children, uh, son and daughter, Marley and Bradley. And then I have, uh, you know, I'm married. And so I have an amazing wife. And, you know, it starts with family first for me. And uh, the studio kind of, it isn't secondary, but there's always that, you know, it's kind of a wave. It's going up, down, up, down. And you got to kind of keep this healthy balance. But I also, I'm an educator, arts educator. So I teach in, uh, in Boston Public Schools. And then I, I, you know, I also do some adjunct work. Where my day, I think, starts with, you know, making sure that, you know, some of the benchmarks or steps or processes that I have in place are there. One is, you know, what are the overall projects that I have on deck, you know, uh, and what are the deadlines for those projects? You know, being a, a, you know, an artist and an arts educator, you know, I flow kind of fluidly between studio practice and, and designing programming for large groups. Most of it's art-based, but it does have a design element to, to as well. How would you consider your work political? It seems like a lot of your work has to do with kind of place and being able to like find your place and how you fit in. So I would love to hear like a little bit more about, you know, the conceptual parts of your work and how you think about your work, especially with the political background that we're at today. A lot of the work that I create has been about um, dealing with issues around black, the black male body, primarily looking at it from the lens of like sports and also looking at it from the lens of like ritual. When I think about politics, it's the politics of me just being here and having this conversation with you, growing up in Boston or in the Dorchester area, being a first generation immigrant, you know, um, also, you know, graduating from, you know, with the undergrad and going get a, a master's from Yale and all that stuff. There's 
politics behind that because of the, the system in which we all kind of live in, right? Um, and the idea that, you know, those who have been privileged have more opportunities than others, right, to excel. My work is about my path navigating all of those spaces. And just because of that, there is there is a going to be a political land. So it's even more heightened uh, with the areas, you know, situations around Black Lives Matter, around police violence, around institutional racism. You know, these isms are, are more heightened. It's always in flux because it's about the viewer's interpretation of my body in juxtaposition or of what I produce. I, I'd love to say that someone says, hey, he's just an artist. But in most cases, they'll look and say he's a Black artist, right? I, I'd love to say that they just meet me as an artist. And, but, you know, the society we live in has different stereotypes and, and different ideas of what that body represents um, in terms of critical thinking and art. So there's the, po the politics of the body, the politics of um, the space that I exist in, and also the politics of the conceptual framework in which my ideas exist. Your response is like exactly how I feel as well about, you know, work being political. Um, you know, so I, I totally, I appreciate, you know, your candidness and your answer and, you know, having that conversation, I think is really important. Thank you so much. Maybe show us some of the work that you've been up to and we yeah. can kind of hear a little bit more about some of the actual pieces. Luckily, luckily I have a trusty assistant that perfect <laughs> that can, so thank you so much annie so i've been looking at ethiopian uh and, and looking at early like byzantine images of saints and so i started doing a lot of these smaller studies of uh and, and replacing the western um portrait or the head with that of you know someone of color who's black and so I've had this kind of uh, fascination with exploring ideas around um, blackness and how that has a you know a universal uh, sense, a universal space for identity making. And then, uh, yeah, we can. Thank you so much, Annie. So um, yeah, let's just go outside. I'll show I'll show one of these larger pieces. Uh, I've been working on this piece once again using these. Uh, symbols. I had an opportunity. I, I received the MFA Traveling Fellowship, and uh, I went to my country of Guyana. And while I was in Guyana, I, I found that, you know, uh, I'd never seen a mosque next to like a Christian church next to like a Hindu temple. Never seen a what? So I came back thinking about how I could bring these bring these ideas of that kind of collective experience of being Guyanese um, in, into my work. And these are based on those small drawings that you've been working on? Yes, yeah, yeah, those are based on the small drawings that I, I, I've been doing. And then this is kind of, um, uh, so I talked earlier about using the geometry of the basketball court. And so what you're seeing is that I take like the free throw line, I take the, the outer, you know, the, Three point line. I take all of that the geometry from the court and I've re articulated into kind of like, you know, my own language, if you want to call it that. I also position my body in um, as, a, as a part of, you know, a series of works that I did uh, that was looking at, you know, the transformative uh, feeling or effect of uh, basketball, not only as a sport, but as a transcendent kind of. A ritualistic experience for Black males within the context of America. I was able to see your work on your website, and I love that series that you had done with you kind of in all these different places with the basketball. Oh, yeah, the passing series, yes. Anything else you want to share before we stop recording? Super excited to have this opportunity to kind of take you guys on a trip through my, through my studio and kind of see some of the things that I'm working on. Naomi, we're standing in your studio. Um, I'm hoping that we can just have a quick tour and I'd like you to explain a few things that you're working on and um, just a little bit about how you found your studio space. Oh, okay. So let me flip this view and I could take you on a tour. That's the entrance over here. So you walk in and this is my space.
Yeah, I'm in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. I've been in the building since 2010. Great. It's a, it's a really nice spot. You get nice light. Yeah, and I have windows. I, I, uh, maybe I could show you the view. Uh, it's really rainy day in New York, but you could see it's kind of a really Brooklyn view with the yeah. train tracks. Uh, yeah, we're on Bergen Street between Franklin and Classen. Do you have anything in your studio that you always need with you in order to work effectively? Yes, my favorite tool. Um, I use cement, so this is my favorite tool. And what, and just for the, the audience, what is this? It's a pallet knife. Um, I think a trowel even, but it's, I bought it at the paint store, so it is for painting. But I mix my cement with it, so yeah, it's my favorite tool. And then I, of course, have it uh, here. Let's flip this view. I, of course, have it in like um, very different uh, sizes and shapes. I would love if you could just explain your process a little bit. And um, I'd love to talk to you about the materials that you're using. They're very cool. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I use, so I start the work using a photograph. So this is the photograph that I uh, glued to canvas. And I take my own photography and you can see it's made out of a stretcher bar. It's stretched on a stretcher bar that I also make. And the canvas is stretched and then the photograph is glued to it. And then I cut holes in the photograph. Um, and then in each hole, I stretch lace. And, and I have a ton of lace. All these bins are full of lace. Uh, that I buy and collect by color and by pattern. And then um, each hole gets uh, it, its own lace color. So uh, it changes from, uh, I, I kind of make the decision of which lace pattern and color according to what's happening in the photographic image. Mm -hmm. uh, the color, like this color matches that. Actually, let me take you to a better example here. Once I fill all the holes with lace, uh, you could see that this has pink lace because it's pink, or this has turquoise in relationship to this. Um, so once everything is full of cement, uh, sorry, lace, uh, I push cement through the back. And here, I could show you a back of a painting. So you could see that's where I use my trowel or my painting knife to push in the cement from the back and then it comes um, it comes out this way. And you could see the relationship with um, with the colors around. And I also use the photograph, the seam of the photograph ends here and then this is cement and lace. One of the things that I was so drawn to in your work is that a lot of it um, has to do with these empty spaces and the way that you are literally taking away and constructing it after you've taken the photograph um, kind of makes the photograph into a living sculpture. Um, I was hoping you could explain a little bit about how you came across the lace and cement combination and why it's important to your work. Yes, yeah, so I, um, I was really, I was at Brandeis at the time actually, and I uh, was trying to paint uh, from photographs of my home. And so I would um, try to paint cement uh, and I got really frustrated trying to depict cement with oil paint. And the slickness of the material was in uh, kind of, didn't work out with the, you know, with the um, kind of toughness or like the texture of cement that is so like, you know, um, not smooth and slick. And so I was thinking of what can I, like as somebody uh, who was a post -back student, I, somebody gave me advice and said, why don't you use the actual material? I was making a project for advanced drawing class 
uh, as a senior and uh, I wanted the cover of this book of drawings to actually be cement. And so uh, the tech at the time, Ian Boyd said to me, why don't you use cement? And so I was like, oh, and he said, go to Arthur and get some cement from him. I'm sure he let you both like take some. And so I mixed it and everybody in my final review when I was a senior talked about the covers of this book, which I still have. And I, um, I was like, oh, well, if everybody's talking about this thing, it must be interesting. And for me, it was interesting too, to work with the actual material rather than try to make a depiction of something. And so when I got to graduate school that fall, I bought my first bag of cement and I still buy cement. It's here, I keep it in a plastic bag um, and in a box and I, you know, I use it. Um, it's Portland cement. And then I made a lot of, for a long time, I made just gray, I just made gray, gray squares. And I was in graduate school and everybody was talking to me about minimalism. And I was like, minimalism is great, but I wanted to talk about the relationship I had to my home. And maybe this is a good, like, you know, to one's place, right, space. And so they, um, so then I kind of also got tired of making these square abstractions. So uh, I started looking at the world, what else can cement be you know in relationship to and i started putting cement on cardboard and on my photographs in a very like as though it was paint and it was crumbling and falling apart so i had to learn about the properties of cement and then one day i went to the fabric store and i found um i looked at lace and i was like oh my god lace has holes and i can push the cement through it and i was at the time pushing cement through window screens and so like looking for, for things that can contain the cement. And so um, the lace was an amazing discovery because there were so many different colors and patterns. And, um, and so I bought a lot of lace and I pushed it through. And then I loved the conversation that I had in the studio where my professors at grad school were saying, oh, lace, uh, the domestic, the feminine, the home. And I was like, yes. You know, it is about intimacy. It's about a very, uh, it's about our livelihood. It's about a place. It's about my relationship to this place. You know, it's about my home or my longing for home or how, you know, it's conflicted and so forth. So, yeah, so that was a good um, territory to go to. Uh, I work at an art consulting firm that puts artwork into hotels and hospitality spaces. Um, one of the things that we have is an online gallery where people can go on and potentially purchase artwork through our website. Um, a lot of startups mm -hmm. for art have now been focused on creating virtual galleries. Um, I'm curious what your opinion mm -hmm. is on how that changes or uh, influences your artwork um, and if, you, if it's something that you're interested in moving forward with in the future. Although I think like the internet and online uh, Zoom and online shows are great because they allow this, uh, you know, you don't have to be in New York anymore to see shows. You don't have to, you know, come to Brooklyn, to Crown Heights to do a studio visit, but uh, you miss other elements of being present with um, the actual paintings or the actual works. It's, it's so hard to experience and our work online because like you said you can see it and you can have a very different idea of what it is in your head versus experiencing it in person you really get the entire feel for the story that the artist is trying to tell um, and the physicality of the actual object like even paintings that are made with oil paint have a physical present how did going to brandeis influence your path as an artist and what did it teach you I, I'm really grateful for my time at Brandeis. I came in wanting to be a photographer and I left being a painter. And that had an extreme, you know, changed the trajectory of what I make and who I am as an artist. Um, I really had excellent teachers who really cared and were passionate well beyond, you know, what they were getting compensated. And there was really a great sense of community of artists. Um, 
and I am, as I left Brandeis and went to graduate school and then now I'm teaching at different liberal arts colleges and art school, I appreciate even more the art education I got at Brandeis and the kind of care and community that we had there. Um, some of my best colleagues and friends are still from Brandeis uh, from the art program and I'm, some of them are still artists and some of them are not, but we are all uh, close and I cherish these relationships. Thank you so much for joining and uh, I'll give you another uh, swing of the studio space and everything that I am making and exploring a little bit. Like I made some sculptures that I want to make life size. I'm thinking about expanding the process. Thank you so much for coming and I hope to see you in real life. Awesome. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Yeah, we're so excited, Brandeis community, to learn more about your work and to get to know who you are as an artist uh, in the world. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Bronte. I go by they, them pronouns. I am calling in at this moment from unceded Ohlone territory in Oakland, California. Um, I'm surrounded by oak trees and lots of uh, birds. There's a lot of more than human life um, around me. The work that I feel most committed to is uh, drawn by a quote from a black acupuncturist who goes, he calls himself a black acupuncturist, um, who was the former health and wellness director for a prison abolition org based out of LA called Dignity and Power Now. And he has this beautiful quote where he says black wellness is the antithesis to state violence um, it's in an article he wrote called wellness and the black molecular future in huffington post and that's been kind of my guiding work of um what does it mean to consecrate black wellness um in public I identify as a transdisciplinary artist um, because it really blurs genre. Um, I'm very interested in ritual arts, ceremony, um, public prophetic practice, kind of bringing the, the way of congregating people back in the day through, through church or synagogue or through the mosque into the public um, space and to bring everyone's kind of, the communities art practice out. What does it feel like to actually create the experiences that help us feel liberated? Um, so this image is from a ceremony um, in Oakland. We've worked across Atlanta and Oakland. We're about to start working in Puerto Rico on a ceremony. Um, we're kind of a, we call ourselves a translocal collective that's hosting these ceremonies across Black communities, Black diasporic communities. Um, this image is of a gun washing with Santeros um, in front of Oakland City Hall at the end of a march called the Reclaim the Radical King March that happens annually um, on Martin Luther King Day. And um, these dancers and ceremonialists, in the, at, they're at the altar. If you can see behind, this is a public space where folks are sitting behind them and um, they are washing the guns, they're rebuking the spirit of the, of the guns, they're blowing smoke on them, they're beating them with plants. Um, and this is right before Black mothers and families who've been impacted by police brutality and intercommunal gun violence are about to share their stories for a town free of violence and process these guns to um, the furnace. That, that's the image of the crucible that's in front of Oakland City Hall, um, where folks brought up the guns to the furnace. Um, the main collaborator, collaborator we work with, his name is James Brenner. At that bottom half, you can see where there's some molds uh, where when the guns were poured through the crucible or when they were melted into the crucible, um, the other accompanying metal artists brought the ladles to these molds that reflected stars. Um, and the constellations that were laid out were the stars that were above a brother named Oscar Grant, who was killed 10 years prior. 
um, at Fruitvale Station in Oakland. So there was a kind of invocation of like, how do we reimagine that evening? How do we even reimagine time, perhaps through like changing time and gathering today and um, bringing these guns into these stars and casting uh, prayers and, and prophecy. This is an image with one of our shovels we've made from weapons with James Brenner. These are local um, dancers from a group called Oyanike. Another image of the crucible. This is one of the shovels close up um, in a day where we hosted something with a friends called Permaculture Action Network. We had a, something called a Permaculture Action Day um, with an indigenous woman led land trust in Oakland called um, Saborite Land Trust. This is a ceremonialist at another gathering in Oakland holding up a World War II sniper rifle that we were gifted to do a blacksmithing ceremony with some folks called Raw Tools. This is Oscar Grant's uncle, Uncle Bobby. Multiple families came up and actually uh, beat the weapon to transform it into a trowel, which I can show you those physical objects in a moment in the room. We had a cer another ceremony on Reclaim the Radical King uh, this past January for the Moms for Housing movement out in Oakland in honor of housing justice for um, houseless uh, families. And that's the image of the stars that we made from that ceremony the year prior. This is my colleague, um, our trauma stewardship coordinator at Led to Life, who's thinking about what is our everyday work look like with our families besides just this public work, which is very vulnerable. We spoke earlier a bit about <coughs> art and social practice and art as a way to transform and to bring spiritual awareness and change. And it's really important, the work that you're doing. Uh, so focused on specific communities and it also is universal at the same time mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk a little bit about Brandeis you studied at yeah. Brandeis. Tell us about your experience there when did you graduate what did you study and what was most impactful for you as an artist okay thank you so much um I graduated in 2016 so four years ago it's been a journey since that graduation. I designed a major, arts identity and community building. Brandeis was so impactful for me. I'm so, even just being invited, allowed me to be in gratitude and reflection about the way that my time there served as a rite of passage into my work. I am so grateful to the Black Studies Department at Brandeis and um, so many professors who I just feel so much kinship for. Um, previously, Jasmine Johnson, Greg Childs, um, Aliyah Abdurrahman in the Black Studies Department were so influential to my work. And um, in the Arts Department, I actually applied to Brandeis because I got a pamphlet in my senior year of high school that um, listed a, a department called Peace Building and the Arts under uh, Cindy Cohen. So that really um, that is actually why I applied because I was, it was the first time I saw the language of kind of what would become uh, thinking about art as social practice. And Cindy Cohen was so influential to me, Gordy Feldman, the Peace Department um, at Brandeis, um, Cameron Anderson in the theater department. She had like a kind of multimedia class my senior year where you could work across mediums and it brought me into finding my language beyond just the medium of performance. So I'm so grateful because it was her work that like, I ended up changing my thesis into a, a physical medium, into a plantable book um, with seeds in the pages. And it started to make me think about sculpture and function. And um, it definitely influenced like the work that I'm doing now, getting to kind of bridge all of those worlds um, together. So in the theater department, uh, oh, I had a great time at Brandeis. I had a good <laughs> yeah, we'd love to see some of these objects that you live in and are processing around. And yeah, please share what you think might be relevant, what we might like to see. Okay, yeah. So this is one of the trowels, um, like what was crafted um, in the uh, image with the blacksmithing ceremony. These are crafted by... Um, an arts collective called Raw Tools. 
this is one of my favorite ones because the wood is so nice. We received some wood from felled trees um, from a group called Sacramento Tree Foundation. And this wood is just so beautiful. You can see that it says, as we decompose violence, may the earth again be free. Um, and here's the handle. They're very heavy shovels um, because this is actually the part that is made from a gun. Um, and this is the mold. Yeah, you can see it kind of up close with our little logo with the gun kind of shooting out the plant and the shovel it says led to life on it. This is one of the stars. They're so heavy. I wish you could feel it. The weight is so um, big. I've actually done a performance recently of really moving with this as a kind of like just finding where it led me. Um, How do you think about your work in terms of it being political work? Mm -hmm. What brought me to this work was that my friend at 21, who was a young Black artist, was killed by a 14-year-old, who was a young Black teenager, who was tried as an adult for um, the murder of, of my friend. I remember my friend, another friend, sending me an image of a bike path that these folks called Studio Rosegard made in the Netherlands, where it's a glow-in-the-dark bike path that's alluding to um, Van Gogh's Starry Night. And I was thinking about like, it's so beautiful. And like, it immediately made me think of my friend Xavier because he was killed on a bike path. And I was thinking about this kind of humbling of the monument, humbling of, instead of a monument to Van Gogh, they, they actually made it real. They made it something useful. They made it something beautiful that people could interact with. Um, and I remember thinking if the bike path had been glow in the dark, could that, child have killed Xavier. And, and not just like, is it just a glow in the dark bike path or aesthetic that changes us? But what other things does that mean if a city cares about just the aesthetic and beauty way of a bike path, that, they, that your attention changes? Everything becomes political in my identity, like in, in the identities that I hold and, and how I'm read in the world and what it means to work with. Um, a gun, but it's really not about resistance. It's really about what do I want for me and my community and my people, and and how do we do that together? Thank you so much, Bronte. I'm so looking forward to uh, our live Q and A. Yes. And 